Well, thank you so much. My Redeemer lives, and my life is bound up with his. That's the promise and hope of every believer. I'd invite you to return to Luke chapter 24 today. As we look at one of four accounts of the empty tomb that the word of God gives us. Someone said that we live between two Easter's. The first was the resurrection of the Redeemer, and it ends with the resurrection of the redeemed. And between that lies a spiritual resurrection. People coming to faith in Christ, being given spiritual life. And so we live between two Easter's the resurrection of Christ's body, and then our own resurrection. But we live in the power of the first Easter, that we can go and meet the second Easter. Uh, We can look at the resurrection of Christ two ways. We can look at the facts of the resurrection, what actually happened, what people saw, what they didn't see, what people believed, what they would not believe. You look at the resurrection. But then we also must look at the implications of the resurrection, what the resurrection does, what it confirms, what it achieves. In Romans 1.4, the Bible says that Jesus is declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection of the dead. In other words, his resurrection... Uh, removed any any lingering doubts, confirmed who Jesus always was, his God's unique son. We know in Romans chapter 4, verse 25, that Paul says that he was raised again because of our justification. The resurrection confirms that God accepted Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for our sins. The only thing Jesus died on the cross for was our sins. Our sins. And that he fully paid. In 1 Corinthians 15, uh, every every year I think, should I go to 1 Corinthians 15? And I kind of do every year because you can't look at the resurrection without 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, Paul says that the resurrection confirms that preaching Preaching is worthwhile. If there's no resurrection, then then preaching is in vain. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that without the resurrection, our faith is vain, and people who profess Christ are still in their sins. Jesus didn't rise again from the dead. Uh, Then we have... Some of us have wasted a lot of our time coming to church. A lot of time praying. A lot of time encouraging people and seeking for them to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. But 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that the resurrection confirms that everyone will receive a bodily resurrection. Every one of us, believer and unbeliever, whether you were buried whether you were cremated, whether you were a shark's afternoon tea, trying to go swimming, however, however your body ended its physical existence, uh, the fact that Jesus rises again means that all of us, all of us will receive a resurrection. We're looking this today at one of four gospel accounts. And uh, the reason why they're not identical is because God chose to give us four, not one. If they're identical, you don't need three of them. So we've got four accounts of the resurrection, all bringing unique perspectives. But we can say that all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they do say a few common things. So before we sort of move into what Luke says... There's a few things that all of them agree on. First is that Jesus really did die. He really did die. Uh, Secondly, that on Sunday morning, the the third day, 
Jews would count a day even as part of a day. We know that he was, he was uh, crucified the day before the Sabbath. That takes you to Friday. Then you have the Saturday Sabbath. And then in the early hours, the first day of the week, his tomb was found empty. Empty. Angels would later appear and they would explain to those who came what had happened. The first eyewitnesses of the risen Jesus, the first ones who set their eyes on Jesus, were women who had been his followers. The other thing which all four accounts tell us is that the apostles and the other disciples refused to believe the witness of these women. They were very, very slow to believe. The angel removed the stone, removed the stone, not so that Jesus could come out of the tomb, but so that men and women could enter the tomb and find it empty. There were no witnesses to the resurrection itself. Itself. There's no witnesses. The resurrection is, in fact, the direct opposite of the ascension of Jesus, where, where, where many see him rise up into glory. Silently, invisibly, gloriously, the living body, the living body of Jesus, passes out through the tomb made of rock. The very miracle of God. Well, look at verse 1 of Luke 24 this morning. We have... Luke tell, tells us of that first resurrection morning. In this first resurrection, very, very early in the morning, they, there were women who had been at the cross earlier, who had uh, prepared spices to anoint the body of Jesus, they and certain other women, women with them, and that they are named a bit later on in Luke 24. They had come to the tomb bringing spices. They had come to, uh, to, to give their last loving acts towards the body of God's Son. And the dilemma for them was, how do we get inside? How do we get inside if this tomb has been sealed? It was the first day of the week. Uh, the Jews had the Sabbath, and every other of those six days were were, were named in connection to the Sabbath, the day before, the day after, two days before, two days after. That's kind of how it went. They didn't have the Monday to Sunday that we use. But they had come to anoint the body of Jesus. We know that Jesus' body, Jesus' body had been in the tomb on that Sabbath between his death and his resurrection. In a sense, in a sense, this was the last Sabbath. It was the last Sabbath. Uh, the day of worship had been that first day to remember God in his creative power at the first creation. But the day of worship would move to the first day of the week, Sunday, to honour and to remember uh, God's second work, his redemption, what would be a recreation of men and women who would come to him in faith. It was, it was very early in the morning. Occasionally I'm tempted, should we have a sunrise service? But then I know you too well. I know you too well. Be, you know, be, be, be me and maybe a deacon or two. and uh, oh, well, Maybe next year. Maybe next year we'll do a sunrise service. Um, but, there, but there's something exciting about meeting as the sun rises and, and, and to remember to remember that they came to an empty tomb that these women had come uh, depressed, exhausted, mourning they had come, they had come as mourners they weren't coming as celebrators they weren't coming expecting anything positive. They were, they were coming to anoint a body that would have been otherwise fast decaying in the heat of the Middle East. 
And look at verse 2 and 3. It could not be any plainer. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. What, what Matthew tells us that Luke doesn't, because Luke doesn't need to tell us everything Matthew said. <laughs> the church had that. It had that. We know from Matthew that there had been an earthquake and an angel had rolled away the stone. We know that there was a Roman guard. There were soldiers there who were posted on the Sabbath while those women were at home resting in accordance with Jewish practice. We also know that the guards that, that, that who were terrified by this earthquake and then the appearance of the angels uh, collapsed, collapsed. They fainted, rendered unconscious. And when they woke, they just ran away, ran away. How do we explain this? How do we explain ourselves, Roman soldiers, under the, under the threat of death? You don't, you don't get a reprimand in the Roman army for losing a body. You don't get a warning. You lose your own life. And so they're terrified. They're terrified. And so the woman go inside the tomb, inside the tomb, again expecting to find a dead body. But he is not there. There were no eyewitnesses to Jesus actually rising though they will see him later the resurrected lord and in verse 4 we're told how the women were feeling it says that they were that word they're greatly perplexed it, it has the idea of they're at a total loss a total loss they had no explanation not, the, the, the last thing they're thinking about is that Jesus had somehow overcome the tomb. The issue is, where is he? Who took him? We, we, we just don't know. And they meet in verse 5. They meet, it says, sorry, in verse number 4, Behold, two men stood by them in shining garments now this is a dead giveaway you usually see men in shining garments in scripture angels angels that's right but they had a human appearance shining brightly and god put those angels there to be to be witnesses to these poor women and what is interesting to me in verse 5 is that the angels make a profound statement by simply asking a question. A profound statement. Why do you seek the living or even the living one? Why did you seek the living one among the dead? Why are you even here? Who are you looking for? You're in the wrong place. For a living person. And so the question was actually a statement. The, the, the assumption is. He is not here. It's been said that, 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 that angels. Angels. Must be constantly perplexed. By chronic human unbelief. It's like. Again. Again. Why aren't these humans so favoured by the Lord, so favoured by God? Why, why are they so incredibly slow? Uh, angels come from a place where there are no tombs. There are no burials. There's no mourning where they come from. Why do you seek the living among the dead? Friends, uh, we have prayed today for churches where God's word is preached. And where the bodily resurrection of Jesus is declared. But not every, every church holds to that today. One writer said, all resurrection denying churches look for Jesus among the dead. 
They talk about him like he's still dead. They love the example of the dead Jesus. They preach his courage, his conviction, even his faith. Sentimentality fills their sermons with language about recurrent uh, spring making hope eternal. But the resurrection word is never used except metaphorically. And so unfortunately today, there will be those who will open God's word, open God's word, and they'll talk a lot about renewal and hope. They might even talk about cycles of life and improving yourself. And all of those sort of sentiments lead people to condemnation and death. We preach a bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. Bodily resurrection. Now to remove any doubt in verse 6, verse 6, he is not here but is risen. Removes any doubt. So now they've heard it from an angel. That's pretty good. They've heard it from an angel. And then the angel says, remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. Do you know what the angels have just done? They have paraphrased, they have paraphrased about four or five passages, the times when Jesus told his disciples what would happen in Galilee. The angels were either listening or God told them later. They were listening or God told them later. Angels paraphrased Jesus. It's the only safe paraphrases. The only safe ones. When angels are doing it. But actually, we do this all the time. We do this all the time. We, in our own words, we describe, we share what Christ has done for us. And what the angels do is they take all of Christ's words and they distill them. Essentially, it's this. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men. This was God's plan. That his Son would come and that he would submit to being delivered to a cruel cross. And be crucified. It's the kind of death that was important. And the third day he would rise again. That was equally important. That is in summary. In summary, much like how Paul summarizes 1 Corinthians 15, sort of 1 to 3, that Jesus rose again. The angels are declaring the gospel to Jesus' disciples. And verse 8 is a beautiful verse. It's a beautiful verse. And they, the women, remembered his words. You see, the words are always there. But they had no prominence in the place, in the hearts of the women. And, and in a sense, who can blame them? They're utterly overwhelmed. We know Jesus spoke about the temple being destroyed and him rebuilding and things. And, and maybe there was some confusion there. But, but, but friends, the truth is that Christ had again and again spoke about his resurrection. They remembered his words. You see, we don't understand the resurrection, let alone the death of Jesus, without the words of Christ. You need the Bible to explain what the resurrection is about. Frankly, you need the Bible to explain what his miracles were all about. You need the Bible to understand why Jesus feeds the thousands, why he feeds the thousands. I mean, is it because, is it because they're into catering? <laughs> Is that what this is about? It's about catering? No. He's showing people that he is the bread of life for all people. So you need the Bible to explain to us what the death, burial, and resurrection means. In fact, in Luke 24, you have three episodes. You have the woman's encounter with the angels of the tomb. You have the Disciples on the road to Emmaus, you have Jesus' appearance to his disciples, and you have them being surprised, being corrected, being instructed, 
and then there being a witness coming from that encounter. You have people being called back to God's word. We need the Bible to understand what the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus is all about. And if you reject the Bible, as many people do, you will reject the resurrection. Remember what Jesus said in, in, uh, uh, in oh, sorry, Abraham said in uh, Luke 16, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. If they reject that, then they're going to believe anything else. So the key is not that you have to look at Jesus with your own eyes. Jesus doesn't owe us a private audience today, just to prove, just to prove it. We owe him our trust and our belief. They don't listen to Moses and the prophets. If they don't listen to Jesus and Paul and John, they won't be convinced even if someone rose from the dead. So we know that in Luke 24, the women, they're at a loss. They're at a loss. <laughs> Not anymore. Look at verse 9. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. They become very vocal witnesses. Matthew says they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to his disciples. They ran with this amazing news. In fact, if you look at verse number 10, it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. They're the first ones to see the empty tomb. You have God's word elevating women, elevating their witness. Do you know who, do you know who supported Jesus and his disciples on the road? Well, according to Luke 8, women did. It was the women who put their hands into their pocket and kept Jesus on the road. The women did. They're the ones singled out for putting their money where their missionary was, supported Jesus. Mary Magdalene, who had been exercised of seven demons, what kind of life do you think she had? What sort of life is that? Torment. It's a disaster area. Her life's a torment. You wouldn't wish it on anyone. And, and, and she comes to Jesus and she's not going anywhere. She's going to serve and she's going to give and she's going to hold on to Christ. She's going to be there at the cross. She's going to be there and no one is going to keep her away. I think we need more disciples like Mary Magdalene. More like her. And so Mary is there. But then look at verse 11. And their words. So verse 9, 10, and 11 have the women speaking to the apostles and the 11 and the disciples. And they keep speaking to them and they keep speaking to them. And what happens to these leaders of the church in verse 11? They seem to them like idle tales. And they did not believe them. Probably for the same reason why, you know, many, many men today won't, won't believe what a lady or sister told them. Because they know a bit better. And, and what do you know? What do you know? You're emotional. You've hardly had any sleep. You're imagining this. You, you want a happy ending to this wreck. Utterly dismissive. Utterly dismissive. They said it's nonsense. Nonsense. Mark Twain said, he said, it's not what I don't understand about the Bible that bothers me. It's what I do understand. 
That's troubling. You know what the Bible says about our hearts and the needs we have. So you've got these leaders here, and they are believers, but they're not believing. They're not believing. Let me tell you about the first resurrection. Not even the believers will believe it, by and large. By and large. They won't even be convinced by, by the testimony of other believers, reliable believers, faithful believers. It seems that Luke gives us the names of these women to satisfy. Remember the Old Testament, you need two or three witnesses. Well, we have these witnesses. Well, Peter, it's too much for him. Too much for Peter. In verse 12, he arose, he ran to the tomb, stooped down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves. And he departed and marveled at it to himself at what had happened. So Peter is now in the surprised mode. He's not in the believing mode yet. But he's thinking. He's trying to process these clothes, these clothes. Uh, we know from John's account that the cloth that covered Jesus' head lay by itself. And so you have grave clothes placed in the shape of a body being laid. You don't have the clothes being rolled up and placed to the side. You have these clothes which are laying as though someone had been lying in them and then the body just plain disappears. Not even, not even Lazarus gets that resurrection. He's got to wear his grave clothes. The clothes still retain the shape of the body. Peter, he's thinking about it. <laughs> he's still wondering. Still wondering. This doesn't look like the body stolen. That'd be very odd for the thieves to, to do that. Isn't it clear from Luke that these disciples are not myth makers? It's the last thing they're going to do. Last thing they're going to do. What changes things? Well, if you look, look at, you're in Luke 24, look at verse 33. 33. And this is after hearing from the road to Emmaus account. These two disciples, verse 33, so they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and they found the eleven. Okay, found the eleven. And those who are with them gathered together. So the eleven are going to hear from the two now. They've already heard from the women. They're going to hear from these two disciples. Saying, the Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Now as, he, as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and he said to them, peace be still. So he miraculously appears. Just like he can leave the grave clothes and leave the tomb, now he can just appear inside a room where the disciples are. He says to them, peace to you. Doesn't wish them harm, wish them peace. But, verse 37, they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. I mean, the human reaction is anything, anyone else but Jesus. Anyone, anything else but Jesus. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your heart? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh. And bones, as you see, I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Now surely that would be enough. No, no. Look at verse 41. For while they still did not believe for joy, now this is getting better, they're ecstatic, they're ecstatic. And they marveled and he said to them, have you any food here? <laughs> I'm going to eat in front of you. 
I'm going to eat in front of you. That ought to do it. That ought to do it. So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb. And he took it and ate in their presence. And on the account goes. These disciples were very slow believers. They were very slow believers. And so don't get too upset with Thomas. Don't get upset with him because he just wants what they all wanted. He wanted to see Jesus and touch him. But they would come to believe. And these men who would not and they would not and they would not believe became preachers and witnesses. To such an extent that most would lay down their life. They will lay down their life for a saviour who initially no one could convince them had risen again from the dead. Why does Luke have this here? Why, why so much emphasis on the lack of belief? Because, friends, it magnifies the miracle. It magnifies the miracle of Jesus. I mean, it's a wonder that anyone believes, frankly. It's a wonder anyone does. Because, because Christians for generations have been doing what the apostles would not do. That is to believe in a saviour they had never seen. But they saw the empty tomb, they met, met their risen Lord, they came to believe, as we must believe. We must. We don't have the luxury today of, of a personal appearance and audience. But God can give us eyes of faith. Eyes of faith. To behold Christ. The Easter mandate for us today is to come and see and go and tell. Go and tell. We believe this message by faith, so we have to share it by faith. The risen Christ.